spinning it out. So why would I pray? Or fatalism. God knows everything. He knows his mind about everything. He knows what he wants to do. Why is he going to change his mind? Because I ask him something. And God does know his own mind. And he has predestined things, the Bible says. And he, he does know what he wants to do. And yet, he tells us to pray, and he tells us things about prayer, and he expects us to either hold those in tension within the mystery of things we don't understand about God, or to understand how they work together and pray. But if we don't figure out how those go together, a sense of fatalism will come in, and we'll feel like if we pray, it wouldn't matter anyway. Or pride. I think this is really the main one for most American Christians, that I'm doing fine. Why do I need to pray? We're, we're doing pretty well on our own. And then the last one, which I think hides in places, but is actually true for a lot of us, is essentially that we, we, the reason we don't pray more is that we only pray out of moralism to begin with. That is, God in the Bible tells us to pray in a few places. Therefore, to obey God, we have to pray sometimes. So we'll pray enough that we're fulfilling the commandment. But what we really know is that God will act on our behalf when we obey him. That's what we really believe. When we obey God, when we do the stuff he wants us to do, he'll bless us. He'll give us the stuff that we want. So it's not really prayer that unleashes into our lives the things that we really feel like we need, but it's actually obeying God. And so I'll pray enough to obey God, and then I'm going to go out and be a good legalist and a moralist, doing everything I'm supposed to do, and then being angry at why God doesn't bless me more. And essentially, it is missing the entire notion of what prayer is, because prayer is based on the concept of grace and divine generosity. That is, God likes to freely give to people who don't deserve things, when they just ask him. In fact, of all the five up here there, the last might be the worst. If four and one weren't so bad, and two and three. <laughs> when any of those things creep in, we can say that we're a Christian. We can be a Christian. We can believe that we should pray. We can believe prayer is important, and we won't pray. And I believe that for a lot of us individually, and for a lot of us in particular, I'm sorry, and then all of us generally, that we've got issues with some of these things. And it leads us away from the stark statement in this passage where Paul goes, devote yourself to prayer. He goes through the whole epistle. He spends three chapters on the gospel and the beauty of Christ and what Christ has done and how that makes a new humanity and a new person and a new creation and how we can be heavenly minded and all this amazing stuff. And then he does a short section on what the family ought to look like, the, the household code, the basic social interacting of, of, of Christian human beings, right? And then he tells, he, he's got two pieces of advice, right? He's got one shot at these people, right? He's got a very short letter. He's only got two pieces of advice besides believe the gospel, right? Well, what are they, right? They're devote yourself to prayer, right? And the, what's the other one? Be wise in the way you treat outsiders, people who aren't Christians. You've got to be wise about that. They don't understand what you're like. They don't understand why you do the things you do. They don't understand why you believe the stuff that you believe. They don't, they don't understand that, and you can really turn them off and really hurt them and then hurt yourself and hurt the name of Jesus by doing that. You've got to be wise. That's next week. This week I want to focus on devoting yourself to prayer. Now there's, there's essentially three things that he focuses on in terms of how to devote ourselves to prayer. And the first is that we're supposed to do it in watchfulness and thankfulness. In watchfulness and thankfulness. You can shape, in a lot of ways, your entire prayer life around those words. Be devoted to prayer, in watchfulness, and thankfulness. Thankfulness is essentially having the right attitude toward God. You're prone to be arrogant and entitled in what you need to be instead is thankful, because that's reality. The second thing is, you have to have, or you have a right attitude about yourself. You actually are not safe. You're not a super good person that is impervious to imploding. You actually are a sinner. The flesh is still operating in you. You're not near as wise as you think you are, and you're always a hair's breadth from spiritually imploding and going down the wrong road. You need to be watchful. You are not safe. And then you pray that. So, um, if you actually look through Paul's epistles, there's 13 of them from Romans to Philemon in the New Testament after the Gospels and the book of Acts. In every one except for one, the book of Galatians, Paul starts out with a, what's called a thanksgiving section, which is also usually a prayer or connected to a prayer, because when Paul prays, he prays thankfully. 
And one of the things you'll notice if you read his prayers, whether in 2 Timothy or in, or in um, Philippians or in a number of different places, it's, it's interesting. Just, you read through Paul's prayers and say, what does Paul pray for? What does he pray for? And you know what you'll find? He, you, never in any of the writings of the Bible does he ever pray for anybody's stigmatism. Right? There's a point where Timothy is sick, he has stomach problems, and Paul says, you probably ought to drink some wine because you have a bad stomach. He doesn't say, I've been praying for your stomach, right? Isn't that interesting? But he prays all through the epistles. He's always praying. He's, you know he's always praying for? He's thanking God for what God is doing in people's lives through Jesus and the gospel and the power of the Spirit and the work of the church. And he prays that God would do more of it. That's all he's ever praying for. God made you a partner with us. He changed your life. He brought you to the gospel. He, he helped you believe in Jesus. He filled you with his spirit. He did these things. You've been a comfort to me, a partner in the gospel, and so on. There's all this stuff where he says, we've partnered together. You believe the gospel. The church is strong where you are. This is so great. I'm so glad that you've— Now, I'm going to die. Now, you die with me. I'm so glad for your partnership. This is— Like, these are the prayers that Paul prays. And he doesn't pray for people's health. And he, now, that doesn't mean he didn't. In local situations, we know from the Bible he did do that. Right? There's a place in Acts where he's like, yep, there's a handkerchief that hit Paul or something, and it was heal people were getting healed. With it. Like, clearly, the ability to heal people physically was coming off the guy because of the power of God in him. It's, just, it's nothing against praying for healing. It's just when he wrote to people, when he had something that was going to be circulated, read over and over again, and people were going to get from him, how do we pray? What should we pray for? What's the most important thing? It was always thankfulness, watchfulness. It was always that what the gospel has done and what we pray to God it would do in us. And we've got to calibrate how we pray around that. It is a fact that having a thankful disposition and having a discipline in your life of being thankful rather than complaining unleashes an enormous amount of happiness. Not just in you, but in all the people you're going to be around that don't want you to be terrifyingly tedious. As much as people are polite when you complain to them, they actually don't give a rip. Nobody wants to be around people who are constantly complaining about this and that and the thing and how this person treated me, blah, blah, blah. They want to be around people who have the power to forgive, who have the courage to live their life, who see their cup as half full, who know God has blessed them and gifted them and helped them, and that there's a lot of good things happening in their life, even if there's some terrible things happening in their life. You just need to know that when you complain to me about little things, and I was just at somebody's house that week who's on hospice and dying of cancer and who is thanking God and praising him for all of his graces to them in their life, and then you come and complain to me about your children, I want to help you do better with your children. But you've got to realize that I was just saw something else. Thankfulness unleashes happiness on a level that most people would not accept. But here's the thing, that's not the best thing about thankfulness. That's not the most important thing about thankfulness. Thankfulness orients you rightly toward God and unleashes godliness. That's the most important thing about thankfulness. That's why thankfulness is so worthwhile. Not so you can be happy and you can have more endorphins or something. It's so that you can be more like Jesus. And Jesus is the happiest being there is. We should devote ourselves to prayer. In prayer, we should be devoting ourselves to being thankful, partly because it makes us happy, but mostly because it produces godliness. And godliness leads to blessing and happiness. But it's, it's worthwhile chasing even if it makes you miserable because it's good intrinsically. And we should, there are some things we have to learn to love. One of the things, Paul, um, Paul <laughs> Lloyd, <laughs> preached on this passage a few weeks ago in chapter 3. You can tell him I said that. Um, one of the things that people sometimes don't pick up in this is, this is where Paul is saying, this is how you should live together as the church. This is what you should do. This is, when you get together, do this stuff. It was kind of like the in the church passage in Colossians. And notice in each case, he talks about thankfulness, but it's always, it's not, Okay, and then say some thankful things. It, it's always stuck in there. Like, as you do this, have thankfulness be the air it all breathes. J.I. Packer one time said, 
was asked, why in the book Knowing God is there not a, a section on prayer? And he said, here's why. Because the minute you make prayer its own thing, you demote it. Prayer is supposed to be in everything. It's like having a meal. You've got your, you know, your meat, and you've got your potatoes, and you've got your, your grilled zucchini and stuff, and then you've got your salt. Right? He's like, that's not how it works, right? You've got salt in everything. Prayer is like that. You can't be like, oh, we've got prayer over here. That's one of the reasons why Wednesday night prayer meetings almost never work. They're great. We should have them. I'm not saying we should cancel it. We should all go more. But it's one of the reasons why prayer meetings are usually disasters in terms of attendance. This church used to have a really big prayer meeting back in the day. There was also a sermon at it and worship music. It was like a church service in the middle of the week where there was prayer. Because what— and what, one of the things we've tried to do more recently is pray in your small groups substantively. We train the small group leaders how to do prayer in small groups. We put the pastoral prayer back in Sunday morning so that we all pray together when we're here. And I'm going to say some other things about how you inculcate prayer into— you have a Packer party. There's prayer at the Packer party. There's prayer in everything. More people clearly should have prayed last night at their Badger party. <laughs> right? As you go, right, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. That's where you should be inside, right? And be thankful is how you do that, right? And then he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So preaching and singing, right? That's basically 95% of what we do here, right? And how does he end that? With gratitude in your hearts to God, Right? And then if he hasn't been general enough, he's been too specific, he says, now in everything that you do, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? Do it for Jesus. Do it like Jesus. Do it for the reputation of Jesus. But always giving thanks to the Father through him. Do you see how he's embedded that in the very nature of how we do everything? If you don't get that point, you're never going to be happy as a Christian. And you'll also never be God in any kind of progressive way. Oh, I keep pushing that button. The second thing is watchfulness. There's a number of things in the Bible that talk about watchfulness. We're told in a number of places to be watchful for, for false teachers. That's the most common thing. And I don't think sometimes we're very, we're very careful about that, right? I make mistakes in my sermons all the time, and there's a handful of people that come and correct me. I'll like, I'll call David Moses. And one person will be like, did you realize you called David? They're kind of different characters. You know, I'll, I'll quote a verse wrong. I'll say a verse is in Ephesians. It's really in 2 Timothy. And one person will be like, did you know that thing that's actually there and you kind of misquoted it? One of the things we're supposed to be watchful about is false teaching. You need to be watchful towards me about false teaching because you have to be watchful towards everybody about false teaching. And you should be praying that I not become a false teacher. Right? But also, it widens out more than that. Yeah, you're supposed to be watchful against direct spiritual predators to false teachers, but also sin, right? If you watchful against sin. In, um, in Luke 12, 15, it talks about greed. There's other places that are similar, right? And then in Galatians 6, 1, there's this verse about restoring somebody. It says, if somebody sins, you who are godly ought to restore them. You ought to help them repent and come back to Jesus. And then, you know what it says right after that? But be careful lest you too also be tempted. Right? It's kind of odd. But there's something about getting into somebody else's mess that they just fell into and trying to help them out of it which can produce a little bit of a nurse syndrome, like falling in love with a patient who may not really be wanting to get out of their sin. And you got to be really careful when you're helping somebody sometimes because there is a sucking into as well as a pulling out of, right? And then also it says, in case it was too specific in 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says to Timothy, he says, watch, be watchful over your life, and your doctrine. That's kind of everything, right? Which can sound a little unnerving that you're supposed to be watchful over everything, right? And as you move on, there's a, a verse later where it talks about Epiphras praying for them because you're supposed to actually help, be helpfully watchful towards other people, 
right? You're supposed to help me be watchful over me, and I'm supposed to help you be watchful over you, as if watching over my own life and doctrine, my own failure and sin, my own temptations when I try to help other people, right, and the false teachers that I'm, res- that I'm supposed to be watchful over all that, that's serious business. The, the good news in that is, is that what's this all in context to? Prayer, right? On one level, it's an, the point here isn't just you need to see everything that's coming after you. You need to be perfectly watchful in your own life. Part of the understanding here is you need to realize all this stuff, and so you need to pray. Here's what it says in Psalm 121, 1 and following. I lift up my hills to the Lord, and where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your, the shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. Now that was a psalm of ascent. It's wisdom literature. It's not meant to be an absolute promise that nothing bad can happen to you. What, it's, what it means to teach is that all of your hope of being watched over and taken care of comes from God. And the minute you recognize your spiritual need to be watchful and you re- realize its relationship to God, you'll realize two things. One is, like Jesus, you need to be watchful. And as you pray that God would make you aware to be watchful, you'll become a better watchman over your own soul and over the other people in your life. Helpfully rather than self-righteously. But in addition to that, you are praying to the actual real God who is there to be watchful over you. You are asking God to deliver on the promise that he's made to be watchful over his own sheep. He says that he is the shepherd over the sheep. What do shepherds do? They watch over the sheep. Jesus does that. He actually called himself the good shepherd. And he says, I don't lose sheep. But one of the things I think that we need to recognize culturally is that we actually are really bad at this watchfulness thing. So it's getting to be close to October, which is going to start— well, I'm sorry, getting a little ahead of myself— September— in which it will start the hunting season for those who fling arrows rather than just fling bullets. And one of the things that those of us who are hunters get in our inboxes as this progresses is the, the I, look at the animal I killed picture. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, the kid, the woman, the guy sitting behind an animal, holding its antlers up usually, pushing them out as far as possible so that they look bigger, right? And hopefully they've put the tongue back in the mouth at least before they took the picture, right? And you just, you, you get just piles of these things, right? If you're, if you're a hunter, at least. And um, as, I was, as I've been gone through some of these, I found this one on the internet recently. And my first reaction was like, who is going to tell this guy what just happened? So I'm like, um, I think you just shot somebody's cow. I've actually thought about, like, making a video of me, like, in my hunter outfit, like, all on camera with my bow and everything, like, in this deer stand, like, doing this little, like, grunt call sequence, you know, to try to, like, you know, and the camera's, like, on me, like, doing that, and then it kind of pans up, and I'm, like, over this big herd of Angus eating at grain troughs, you know, and I'm, like, you know, draw on this, like, cow that's chewing grain out of a trough and shoot it, you know, and, like, hold its head up and talk, you know, I like to thank my sponsor, Real Tree and Matthew's Archery, you know, like that, and then put it on YouTube and monetize it. So if you're a farmer and you've got to kill a cow anyway, I think we could do something here, okay? So, the, but, okay, here's the, the, in New Zealand, you can hunt wild cows, apparently, for a lot of money, which I don't have, and I'm not interested. Anyway, the point is, is that I don't get a rise out of hunting a cow, okay? That's not, that's not interesting. Because you don't have to hunt a cow, right? I mean, the cow's going to, like, I, I grew up on an Angus farm. We'd walk out there. They'd come running to us, you know? They're like, where's the hay? You know, it's, you're kind of, you had to kind of get, you know, put up the electric fence so they couldn't get after you. I mean, it's not rocket science, right? And 
Um, but here's the thing, and I don't know, there's some hunters in here who may have taken like a city dweller hunting because that person thought that they would like to expand their horizons. I mean, I've done this a couple of times where you get somebody who like imagines themselves as like kind of like a hunter because they're either a shooter or they're in Wisconsin now or whatever. And so they shoot their rifle a few times. They're like, I'm ready to be a hunter. And they get, you know, some camo or something. And th the problem is, is that those of us who are hunters act normally when we're not in the woods. But the minute we go in the woods, everything changes. Everything changes. We, we walk slower. Our, the way we use our senses totally change. We listen different. We move deliberately. Because we're hunting something that knows we're coming, that lives in the wild, things are constantly trying to kill it, and they do not want to be killed. Okay? The city guy is like, hey, where's the stand? Are we going to do, like, and it's like you're rustling leaves and knocking things over, wearing cologne, you know, and you're like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, what, what is wrong with you? And it's, it's just simply this. They've never been a hunter, and they apparently think they're hunting something that's never been hunted. They have no sense of how watchfulness works and how predation works. Just don't understand it. And here's the thing. Most modern Americans, because we have not been the subject of predation as people in our physical needs, we have essentially become domesticated. We feel safe. We're not terrified something's about to eat us because, generally speaking, it's not. Like, we have a hard time connecting with, like, and there was a prophet walking down the road in the Bible, and a lion came out and bit his head off. And you're like, what is lions? What? Where was he? You know? Is he Kazbar? Like, we just have no sense of, like, what it's like. In fact, I remember watching this video of um, an, an African couple walking in Africa, and there's this guy, he's just kind of walking, and there's this woman behind him with this huge water pot on her head. Right? And I remember, this is in a women's studies class in undergrad, and the teacher went on for, like, 15 minutes about, like, male patriarchalism and how men don't like women. And blah, 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 blah. It wasn't until years later in a class on missions where I saw a very similar picture. And the missions professor said, do you know why this is like this? I was like, well, because men hate women, of course, and we subjugate them in it, right? And he's like, he's like, no. 85 years ago, when there were jaguars and black mambas, it, the man actually walked in front of the woman with a machete. And it was his job to protect her. She would carry the water, and he would protect them both. But as time went on, and people poached the leopards, and the black mamas got killed, and the roads got laid down more, the brush got cut back more, and the danger went away, the men didn't go, wait a second. I'm not defending us. I could help you carry that, sweetie. Let's— Like, it just—culturally, that, that reformation didn't happen. They just did things the way they always did it. Right? We just— we just do what everybody does. And unless you intentionally recognize that you are the subject of demonic predation and of your own sinful nature, if you don't realize that you have to be vigilant every moment because spiritually you are not safe. You are not safe, spiritually speaking at least. If you don't recognize that, I mean, you're like an Angus where there has just been a season put out on cows and nobody knows it yet. It's going to be a, it's going to be a slaughter. And it's going to be good steaks, but it's going to be bad for the cows. Right? But if you've ever seen one of those shows about, like, antelope and, like, the African savanna, like, those guys are always looking. They're like, what was that? Uh, I saw that blade of grass move. Let's go. Uh, uh. And they're always together. There's, like, seven of them. They're like, do you see that? I saw something over there. What did you do? What? Like, it's very... It's very difficult. Like, most of the time, I mean, you just imagine how many, like, if you're a National Geographic guy, can you imagine how many times you've got to film some lion sneaking up on some antelope before he actually gets one? Like, they don't show you all the real where they don't get one. I mean, can you imagine, too, being the lion? Like, you're sneaking up on the antelope, and the antelope are like, look, there's a camera guy. There's got to be somebody sneaking up on us. We need to get out of here, because I know that's a bad sign, right? Sorry, that was just a joke. It had no spiritual anything. <laughs> but listen, when you start praying watchfully, when you start asking God to be your watchman, when you start asking him to help you be properly watchful, it will begin to attune your senses to being watchful. You'll be paying attention to, and God will actually lead you through his Holy Spirit 
and give you intuitions and insight and lead people in your life to talk to you about the things you're most in danger about. And as you read scripture, it'll jump out at you because you'll be looking for things to be watchful about. <clears throat> and if that becomes a big part of how you pray, it will change the way you see your spiritual life. And it will lead you to be the kind of gazelle that makes it to the end of the broadcast. If that makes sense. I don't tap that right now. The last one is... I'm sorry, this is just the second one. Um, the second one is for open doors, right? It says to pray for what? To pray for open doors. Now, the interesting thing here is if you ask the question like, well, what... Why does Paul pray that? Like, that's kind of a cl Christian cliche, right? Pray for an open door. I need a job. Can you pray for an open door? We're doing this. Can you pray for an open door? Well, here's the reason why it's a Christian cliche. One, it's clearly in the Bible. Two, it's very descriptive. Like, that's very clear what that means. A closed door, you can't get through. An open door, you can. Right? Receptivity is an intangible we can't make happen. And so the idea of there being an open door, it's not something I can control, but if it's open, I can go through, and if it's closed, I can't, is very descriptive, right? But one of the things I think is really interesting about this verse is what door Paul doesn't talk about. That is, do you notice he's in jail? And he does not talk about his cell door. He doesn't say, would you please pray to the Lord that he would let me out of jail? That he would open the cell door and set me free because I'm supposed to be free in Christ. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm in chains for the gospel, but would you please pray that I would have an open door opportunity so that I could preach about the mystery of Christ. Now, that is an attuning of focus that we don't really generally have. Right? We tend to be focused on what we consider the big picture of our life, like what's going on, what's hurting us, what we don't like, how our life isn't going the way we plan, and so on. And that is not the way Paul saw the world. Paul was focused in on the people, the things that mattered the most to God, the receptivity of the human heart. That's what he was focused in on. And we cannot pray well until we get focused in on the thing that matters. And when the thing that matters is people and their receptivity, one of the things that you should do is despair that you can do that heavy lifting. God promises in the Bible that he will do the heavy lifting of his own ministry. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Right? And so, if you, th and if you think human receptivity of the gospel is simple, you may not pray for it. You might just try to be cool. Right? Well, if I'm cooler, and I'm a Christian, people will be like, well, Christians are cool. Well, maybe I'll be a Christian. Um, that's probably really naive. Not that that's not good. We'll talk about being wise and how you relate to outsiders next week. But what you ought to get from the whole of the Bible is that receptivity to the gospel is a divine action. Its spiritual weight for you to lift isn't a bushel of apples. It's an ocean liner. You better at least be an X-man if you're going to give that a try by yourself. Okay? It's not going to happen. The, when you realize that, you will realize that you need God to do your heavy lifting, and you'll pray. What it will also do is begin to take away your Messiah complex of the things that you feel like you have to accomplish by yourself that you really can't control, which will also make you happier. But that's not the point. The point is that it would make you more godly. What that will produce in terms of praying for open doors is we'll be focused in on the gospel rather than on whatever's bothering us. We'll have a perspective that we need God to do our heavy lifting, We'll realize that everywhere where Paul prays, he's always praying gospel prayers and that he's urgent about them. And we'll get a biblical and spiritual urgency about the fact that people need Christ. And what that will produce is prayer. We will ask God to produce and to create open doors. And what we'll recognize too is, is that, um, sorry, I need to go back. I need to go back to the next one. So you might ask this question, okay, well, so how do you pray for open doors, or in what areas, or in what ways? And there's three major ways that I would say really warrant prayer, and I think you can break it up so you can focus on these. One is in the city and in the culture. So there are people that through God's province, he has elevated certain Christians to places where if they say the wrong thing, they're going to get killed culturally. Their reputation will be destroyed, they'll get fired. Our culture is like that now. And yet those people are going to be in positions where they could do a lot of good if they were to open their mouth 
say something seasoned with salt, they could really have an impact. And those people are always on the knife's edge, and you should pray for them. Christians in public life, Christians in politics, Christians that are very wealthy, and that end up in places where they have an opportunity to do something they have, or something just happens, and they end up put, put into the limelight. We should be praying for those folks, because that is very difficult. Right? I've had people come up to me and say, say to me, I cannot imagine living like you, where you have, like, you have, like, words going out all the time that you can get in trouble for and that you can get our church in trouble for and that like you have to talk i can't listen there are people in situations a lot more scrutinized than me and just in this church that's a very difficult calling and we should pray for them the second is in open doors in global missions we we want to pray for open doors everywhere in the world and one of the best ways to start doing that is by praying for that anywhere in the world um one of the things that missionaries won't tell you is the number one thing that they can get is a prayer partner who prays. Now, generally speaking, it's good to get a financial partner because actually financial partners are in some ways more dependable. Like, you actually know if you're not giving enough. If you said, I'm going to give you $30 a month or $9,000 a month, and you don't give them what you said you did, you didn't do it, right? And if you, like— if you say, I'm going to do it for this long, then you either do it or you don't. It's, it's just not. It's, and then you feel guilty if you don't. It's very objective, right? Prayer is kind of like, yeah, I checked out the prayer card so I didn't have to give. And, you know, uh, well, how much is praying enough for a missionary? Or how much? You see, it's much more relative. But here, here's the thing. Every missionary, anybody who does ministry cross-culturally anywhere, you know what they really want? They actually don't want you mainly to pray for their health or for their whatever. What they really want is for you to pray for open doors. That's what they want. Otherwise, we shouldn't be supporting them in the first place. Any missionary, that's not the main thing they want. They need to come home and get a job at Starbucks. Okay? Now, they want other things, and we should pray for other things for our missionaries, too. We want their health to be great so that they can focus on the open doors God gives them. We want them to have enough money so they can spend their intellectual energy and their mental and emotional energy on the open doors God gives them. We don't want them to get killed so that they can focus their aliveness on the open doors that God gives them. Like, we, we want to pray for other things for our missionaries, but it all ultimately gets to the point where they want there to be open doors so that they can, walk, they can find human receptivity to the gospel and they can share the gospel with them. And you, you don't start by praying for everywhere in the world. You don't have to get an Operation World book and pray through the thing monthly. Every people group in the entire world. So here's, this is my prayer journal, okay? Last year when we had a missions week, there were all these cards in the different pews about different groups of people in the world that had less than 2% Christian. They may or may not have a Bible translated. They, they didn't have an independent Christian witness within their culture, and that you could pray for them, right? So I shuffled through some of the cards. I've been to India three or four times. I really like, I, I, I'm connected with that. I've learned stuff about India. I have missionary friends in India, and so I got the Brahmins of India, right? And it has how many people there are, and how many are Christian, and who, how, what to pray for, Right? And I, it's in my prayer journal. When I open this sucker up, besides looking at the picture of my wife and I kissing in North Dakota, South Dakota, the next thing I see is, because that's the next most important thing to me, is my relationship with my wife. And then I pray for the Brahmins, and I pray, God, give them to yourself. Give them to yourself. Create a receptivity among them for the gospel. Last service, I walked into the epic meeting that I, that I said we should do. An Indian family comes up to me from Boston. They're dropping off their daughter because she just got hired at Epic. He said, my grandfather was a Brahmin. And he found Christ. And we have been a Christian family for two generations. And now I'm dropping my daughter off at your church because she's a believer and I want you to care for her while she's in Madison because our, we believe in the Lord and I'm so glad that you pray for my ancestral people. She was just one service ago. And then as I go through, I've got my friend Manohar, who's a missionary to India, and he's training pastors in local areas to, to preach the gospel better and to not create problems they don't need to create so that the gospel can go forward. And then my friend Adam Mabry, who was in Edinburgh, less than 2% went to church. Most people were not Christians at all. They planted two churches. I constantly was praying that he would find receptivity. Then when the queen kicked him out, he came back and planted a church in Boston because it's just about as secular. And every day, that I get in here, I pray that he would find receptivity at Harvard and at MIT and in the bars and on the streets 
in Boston. I pray for open doors, not because I don't care about his kids or his wife or money or whatever, because I know that's what he wants for me to pray for, because he's a real missionary. And one of the greatest burdens we could have in prayer is to pray for open doors for people who take the gospel across cultures. But then lastly, you need to pray for open doors for you. For you. Now you might say, oh, Nick, this is Paul asking for general church people to pray for him. He's an apostle, right? Yeah, except the very next verses he talks about us being careful with outsiders making sure our conversations are seasoned with salt. What, 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 what do you think that's about? He's talking about conversations seasoned with salt that are gentle with respect. He's talking about the next thing he's going to talk about is us telling people about Jesus. That's the whole, that's number two. Because we should be praying for opportunities for open doors, right? And then the last thing Paul says is he says, devote yourself to prayer for courage and clarity in sharing the gospel and proclaiming it when it's time to do it. When that door opens, you're probably going to be a coward. And you need to be ready to speak with conviction, to have courage, and to be clear. Because when people speak about Jesus, you can, you could be not clear because you don't really know how to explain things about Jesus. But the reason why most people are so unclear is because they're terrified. And we generally don't do anything well when we're terrified. And he says to them, he says, listen, guys, please pray for me so that when that moment comes, I can proclaim it. That is, I can tell it well and directly and do it clearly like I should. Now, you can read other places where Paul does stuff in Acts where he clearly has courage. But when he asks people to pray for him, he asks for courage and clarity because he's going to be in another one of those situations where somebody's going to have a sword out or a whip out or there's going to be some crazy mob and in here he's going to be terrified and in here and in, in here he's got to know who he is and in here he's got to be crystal clear and he needs prayer because he needs a divine power for that and the same thing is enjoined on all of us in 1 Peter 3.15 I'll talk about this a little bit more next week so let's end with this quickly. That is, if we're going to devote ourselves to prayer, what, do we, what are some practical, like, practical ways to do that? What do you, if you want help doing that practically, what can you do? The first thing, and I know that this is a little bit rocket science, start off by praying. Okay? If you, if you, that's just a crazy idea to you, the first prayer you probably need to pray is the one where you accept Jesus as Lord and King and God. Okay, because you have to start a relationship that you can— prayer is an inter, inter, interactive, relational kind of thing. You've got to have a relationship with God to do that. You have that by trusting in God's provision of Jesus to recreate that relationship and change you from the inside and give you His Spirit and all of that. If you don't know how to do that, there's going to be some people right there at the end of the service who would love to help you. And then you just go from there. You just talk to God. And you use those guidelines of, if you don't know what to do, well, pray to God— Start with thankfulness, move on to vigilance, move on to praying for open doors, and move on to praying for courage, clarity. And then move on from there. Second is, and I don't I'm going to take a lot of time to explain this, but a lot of people, especially early on in their Christian life, or some people get into a rut with this for years, is they try to conjure what they really should just ask for. Have you ever done this? You pray, you know you're supposed to be more loving, and so you say, God, please make me more loving. And then essentially what you do is you try to emotionally conjure the feeling of being loving. Because you feel like you want that to kind of happen, and you're kind of like, or you're like, God, please help me get along with Janice, that idiot person at work that I hate so much because she's so awful. Um, please help me figure out how to get along with her. And then you start thinking about what you're going to say to Janice and how you're going to try to get along with her and how she's going to be so terrible, or maybe she'll— right? They're, those are distractions, and you're not a sorcerer, right? When you came to Jesus, you didn't become a wizard, all right? So that you can conjure up feelings of love. You're not loving. God has to make you loving. Therefore, you have to understand the gospel more deeply so that when you see Jesus as he is, it will create love in you. God is going to send you out and give you opportunities in which you're going to have to figure out how to be loving so that you can become a more loving person. Like, God is going to work this out. But what you're not doing is conjuring love. You're asking the divine God who is there to act such that you could become more loving. Don't mistake those two. They're very different.
Third, let's all constantly, the first thing we say when we talk to anybody in this church who says anything worth praying for, which is most things, just the next words out of your mouth are going to be, let's pray about that right now. Let's pray about that right now. Don't say, I'll pray for you. Just quit saying that. You can only say that if the word right before it was amen. If somebody says, share something, that hurt, it's a hurt, something going on, anything. My leg hurts. I'm afraid I'm not a Christian. My parents are getting divorced. I think I'm getting divorced. I think somebody wants to kill me at work. Whatever it is, it's, so you say, can we pray about that right now? Then you pray, and then you can say, I'm going to be praying for you about that. Meaning, when I walk away, well, I'm going to keep praying for you, but we just prayed right now. Let's just make that, that's the line, boom, and then you pray. And then you use exactly what Paul said here. Thankfulness, watchfulness, praying for open doors, courage and clarity. You use that to sculpt your prayer life around, you'll do pretty well. You'll do pretty well. Thankfulness will change your perspective about God. Watchfulness will change your perspective about you. You'll realize how great Christ is and how much you need him. You'll cry out to God for his spirit to do something in you. You'll be praying for the right stuff. And that will really begin to change the way your heart is motivationally devoted to prayer. Because we'll shed the atheism and the deism and the fatalism and the moralism and the pride. Because you need to remember all of this is wrapped up in Jesus. God gave you Christ when you deserved nothing. So believe the same thing about prayer. We go to prayer, we don't deserve anything. But we're going to a generous God who gives freely to the ungodly. We're going to the God that tells us, hey, you know your enemy that you hate so much? You should love him. He's still your enemy, I get it. You should love him. That's the God you're going to pray to. And he responds. He is the God who watches over you, who neither slumbers nor sleeps. He is the one who showed himself in the person of Jesus who said, I am the good shepherd. Yeah, you 19 seconds, you can throw them out. I know. Let's pray. Father, um, thanks so much for helping us understand who and what we should be in Christ and that um, you have called us to devote ourselves to prayer, not as another work we must do for hours a day so that you'll accept us, but because we are accepted in Christ, because we need to be thankful and watchful, because you've called us to be something in the kingdom of God and in your church and among your people, and that if we know Christ, it's going to make us overflow with thankfulness and a need for you to watch over us and to show us how to be watchful. That, that will drive us to want to speak to the one who is there, who has called us to do so. Tear out the atheism and the deism and the fatalism and the moralism and the, and the pride that's in us that kills our desire to talk to you and help us to become individuals and a people that are devoted to prayer. Pray in Jesus' name.